I'm Jim Whaley. On this Cinema Showcase, my guest is an Academy Award winner, a Tony winner, a Grammy winner, and an Emmy winner. And they're all the same person, the extraordinarily talented Rita Moreno. We'll be talking about her career in films, stage, and television, so join me as I talk with Rita Moreno on this Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase. And join me now in welcoming to the program, Rita Moreno. Rita, good to see you. Thank you. It's so nice to hear my name pronounced properly. That's terrific. You mean it's it's mispronounced? Uh, Moreno. Moreno. Well, mm -hmm. I suppose it's natural, but it's very nice to hear Moreno uttered now and then. I've got to ask you, since you are officially listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the only performer to win. The only female performer. only female performer to win all the major awards. Mm -hmm. Do you ever pause to reflect on that? And, and think, do, you, do your thoughts go beyond, gee, that's nice, or what are your thoughts when you think you've won all those awards? The first thing that always occurs to me is that uh, I'm Hispanic, I'm a Puerto Rican, and I'm the one who did it. Mm -hmm. That always uh, fills me with pride. Uh, we need all the help we can get in terms of uh, positive public image, so that, that delights me. And the other part of it, of course, is the show business part of it, which is... Uh, truly astounding because uh, Barbara Streisand has all four. One of hers, however, is an honorary one. I think it's the Tony. Mm -hmm. And uh, mine were all one in competition. So it's, it's up there with, um, with the big lead folk. And yeah. it just delights me. I love it. I'm very proud of it. There are those people, as you know, who have, for one, put down the... You don't hear too much about people putting down the Tony Awards. They're always happy to get a Tony, always happy to get uh, various it's other It's so awards. legit, isn't it, the Tony? But you have heard, I'm sure, that some people don't care for the Oscar. They call it too political, too whatever. How do you feel about it? Well, that? it's been that way. It's been that way for far too long. Uh, I don't think that uh, a performer should be allowed, or a director or anyone else within a medium, should be allowed to take out ads promoting themselves for an award. It's, it's, it's self-defeating. It's contradictory. It's, it's positively bizarre. And yet our two show business um, Bibles, Variety and Reporter, a few months prior to the uh, Oscars happening and before the nominations actually, are this fat, where normally mm -hmm. they have four pages, <laughs> are this fat with ads. Uh, it's a shame and it does besmirch the, uh, the image of the Oscar. I didn't take out ads for... Uh, my Oscar for West Side Story, and it makes me feel all the better that I won it mm -hmm. despite that. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't understand how people, um, actors, can handle that and look at themselves in the mirror and well, say, yes, I won. I say, yeah, but is it so much, you have? <laughs> is it so much the actor as it is the studio? Well, it's the, the studio, of course, also pushes it terribly. Mm -hmm. the, the actors, uh, absolutely, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I was presenting only one side of it. Uh, the actors are very pressured by the studios to do it. And if, if they're in a lead role and the chances somehow smell pretty good, the studio is really going to push it. And if the actor doesn't take out ads for himself, the studio definitely will. And the studio does it all the time. I just think that should be abolished. Yeah. I should think, I think it should turn into a, uh, it would still be nice to see it on television, but it wouldn't be nice to see an hour and a half of it, not three mm -hmm. and a half hours of it. I think the numbers should be taken out of it, maybe open with one wonderful musical number. Then you know it'll be good, because this time, mm -hmm. it'll mm -hmm. be one good musical number as opposed to eight terrible ones. You know, oddly enough, ones. those sometimes are the things we tend to remember about the Academy They're Awards. They're embarrassing. Oh, wonderful, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a lot okay. of that stuff is embarrassing. It, it's, it's been stretched. You know, it's like a piece of gum that's about to just break in the middle. Uh, it's a shame. They still talk about one Academy Awards program. I think it was the 1957 Oscars where Jerry Lewis was the MC, And they ended up with 20 minutes that they had to fill. The program was actually over. That's unbelievable. But they, but they you had, mean they were actually yeah, early? 
and Jerry Lewis ended up calling everybody up on stage, and I haven't seen a tape of this program, but they say it's absolutely hysterical slash disastrous. So. Hysterical meaning hysteria in here or funny? Well, I think a disastrous. combination of both. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. Oh, good. I, I'm not a fan of his, but my God, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I know. <gasps> 20 well, minutes, what a way to have fill to it in. Tonight. Fill, fill <laughs> 20 minutes. Oh, what a curse. Um, you are right now involved in a uh, tour that's headed for Broadway of a, I guess we could call it a, a uh, new version of Neil Simon's The Odd Couple. It really is a new version, yeah. Uh, how did this come about for you? Apparently for years, uh, a number of actresses had gone to Neil and asked him to turn it around and make it an all-female production, and, and it didn't interest him. Or he felt he'd gone past that, and the odd couple had been done. God knows what's successful, not only on stage, but the film and the series. And he probably felt, rightly at that time, it's been done. You know, how much more can you do with it? And uh, a year ago, his brother, Danny Simon, who is a director and used to co-write with Neil, they were the Simon brothers who wrote for Sergeant Bilko and some mm. wonderful shows, mm -hmm. uh, convinced Neil to at least let him, Danny, stage a reading. And for civilians who don't know what that means, it simply means the actor's reading from the script sitting around the table, but acting. And Neil finally said, okay, all right. So Danny Simon put together some terrific actresses. He, he's got a wonderful eye for casting. And he brought a bunch of us together, uh, plus two men, in place of the Pigeon Sisters, who are the dates in the male version. And Neil made some very perfunctory changes. He's to she's, she's to he's, and a couple of just little extra lines to bridge certain gaps that were necessary for a uh, quick reading. Neil came to see it, along with about a dozen friends of the, both Simons, and uh, laughed his head off. I mean, really, really laughed. I think he'd forgotten how funny that play is. And as soon as it was over, called up Emmanuel Eisenberg, his producer of many years, and said, book it, just book it. We've got Rita Moreno for Olive Madison, which is Oscar. Uh, and they, he said, we'll find a Florence which is really the harder part to cast. It's a very difficult part mm -hmm. to cast. They found Sally Struthers. We've now been on the road almost six months. It's a pre-Broadway tour, which is a different thing from a national tour of a proven play. A pre-Broadway tour really means, let's see what's good about it, let's see what's right. bad about it, let's rewrite, let's cut, that sort of thing. And uh, wherever we've been for six months, we've either broken house records or uh, sold out. Marvelous. So um, we'll be in, in New York in June at the Broadhurst Theater. Why do the critics, well, let me qualify that, why do a lot of critics not give Neil Simon the credit I think he deserves? They, they call him either a gag writer or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've, I wonder about that myself. I think Neil wonders even more. And uh, since you're going to be interviewing him shortly, it'll be interesting to see what Neil says. Um, there's something about the legit theater. Uh, there's a certain kind of snobbery about someone being funny and making millions of dollars, being cleverly funny and making a million dollars that is anathema to a critic's mind. Uh, I know that sounds terribly simple-minded in terms of an explanation, but I can't think of any other. Um, he's good. Mm -hmm. He's so funny. He's so clever. No, he's not Ibsen, but then uh, Ibsen's dead. There are other people who have replaced people like Ibsen. Uh, Arthur Miller, who hasn't had a hit play for many years, mm -hmm. doesn't get scathed and, and excoriated the way that uh, Neil does. And you can very often almost expect that there will be mixed reviews for whatever the play is, yeah. no matter how good it is. There will always be one critic who says, eh, it's all right, or when is he going to finally take himself seriously, or when is he going to do a uh, <laughs> checkoff? Uh, I don't know what, what it is that... Uh, he's awfully rich, you see. He's yeah. a very wealthy, yeah. very, very wealthy man. And I think that, that you're just not supposed to be that. And, and by the way, has had either 20 or 21 hits. Mm. Isn't that astounding? 
It's incredible. And we're not talking about cheap comedy. Uh -huh. We're talking about comedy that's very clever, that's behavioral and all kinds of things. And I have a feeling 25 years from now we will still be well, laughing at this the odd couple classic. at Plaza sure. Suite and so many other things. Mm -hmm. Whereas many of the promising playwrights that are getting all the raves right now, where will they be? Mm -hmm. I one firmly does wonder. believe that. Yeah. Without trying to sound like sour grapes, one does wonder. Yeah. Is it true, and I've heard this about Neil Simon, that he is very, very particular about the written word as far as Neil Simon goes, that he does not care for changes too much. See, I, I don't understand how that ever got around. On the, he's the first one to change things. Now, he can be very stubborn about something that he feels is right. And it may turn out that he's wrong. I mean, it happened on, on The Odd Couple. Uh, and you have to prove to him that that line isn't right or worthy or whatever it is. What you don't like about it, you have to prove. The only way to prove it is to do it on stage before an audience for at least a week and see, or even overnight, he might realize you might say, okay, let's take that one out. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But uh, my goodness, he's, um, he's the original rewrite man. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't but know he does have that reputation, to. though. I have heard that. He before. does. I didn't. I wasn't aware yeah, of that. I have heard that from several people that he. Well, maybe what you heard, though, maybe <coughs> there was some misunderstanding. Neil is extremely particular about his rhythms. Now, Neil has a very special rhythm when he writes. You, you as the actor playing the character, cannot add a handle to his speeches. You can't say, "Oh, is that right?" When it's written, "Is that right?" You'll kill it, nobody will laugh, and you'll wonder why if, if you don't know Neil Simon's work. And when you take out the O oh from the is that right, you realize that it has a very special rhythm. And he's worked it out. Mm -hmm. He knows. He knows what he's doing, sure. Oh, does that man know? You must not put in handles or us. Mm -hmm. A lot of actors, most of us, in, in an attempt to be naturalistic or real, yeah. we'll put in a lot of, uh, yeah, well, uh, I... Uh, you don't do that with Neil Simon because you will ruin his work. It's very carefully thought out. And by the way, a lot of his writing is difficult, at least in The Odd Couple it is, so difficult to memorize because it's very colloquial and very peculiar to his kind of New York-ness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. his, his sentences sometimes are so convoluted. I'm trying to think of one offhand that was so hard for me to learn. Uh, Florent, we can't stay home alone every night like this. We need to meet some men. When I'm trying to convince her to, to, for God's sake, let's go out on a date. It took me the better part of two weeks to get that sentence out properly. Florence, we can't stay home alone every night like it. It was, it's <laughs> strange. Isn't it strange? But the rhythm is all important. That's yeah. right. It's there for a reason. Yeah. I remember Mary Martin telling me that she had exactly the same kind of problem when she was doing a play with Noel Coward in London. I think Pacific 1860 was the play. He had her go through at her opening bit of dialogue 50 times before she got the rhythm exactly the way Noel Coward wanted it. Oh, especially so Noel Coward, yeah. though, because this stuff was also done uh, in rapid fire yeah. kind of delivery, which is difficult for an American to oh, do. Oh, sure. No one talks that quickly sure. in this world except the English. I've got to ask you about some of the, the marvelous films you've made. Um, your film career, of course, did not begin with West Side Story. You made a number of uh, Fine films before that. You were under contract to MGM when that studio was the, the epitome it was in of glamour. Yes. What was it like at, at Metro during those years? It was extraordinary. I was uh, 17 years old, going on 18. And uh, when I was signed to MGM, my first day at MGM was extraordinary. I was going to make, I had already been assigned a film, which was a Joe Pasternak film with the then hot tenor of the time, Mario Lanza. I was going to make a film called Toast of New Orleans mm -hmm. with Mario and Catherine Grayson. And Joe Pasternak, the producer, very kindly said, come on, kid, I'll show you around. <laughs> oh, my beads. <laughs> my beads. I met Clark Gable, Ava Gardner, Esther Williams, Judy Garland, um, Greer Garson. I, these were all the people that were at MGM. But what's really interesting and I was—I needn't tell you this Puerto Rican kid from New York just damn near had a heart attack. I was, ooh, ooh, ooh. An idiot. The only one who remembered my name, which at the time was Rosa Dolores Alvario Rosita, was Clark Gable. Really? The next day, 
I went back to visit my friends, the stars, none of whom, oh, 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 I, I met you yesterday. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they went back to their work. But it was Clark Gable who said, how are you, Rosita? How are you feeling? Mwah! Marvelous. What a classy gent. It was extraordinary. Mm. Um, it was also the last, the last hurrah for a studio that had a stable yes. of stars and young people they were nurturing. That doesn't happen anymore, which is why careers, you know, just fly up into the sky and go into the dumper overnight. There's Would no you, one to, to, to nurture careers anymore. They don't do that. Today, one film or one television show could absolutely kill a career, mm -hmm. whereas then, as you say, you could be nurtured along from one film to another. If one film didn't make it, okay, we'll try it in something else. Well, the, the thing is that they would say, okay, we now have Rosita Moreno, which they then changed to Rita. Uh, what do we have in store? What, what, what pictures, what films do we have in, uh, for the next year in which we can place her so that she will become known little by little in which she will show off? Well, that sort of thing. That's what they did with the young players. That's how Debbie Reynolds became mm -hmm. a star. She was an MGM starlet, sure. along with me and um, um, Amanda Blake and a number, Arlene Dahl, a number yeah. of people. Uh, interestingly, the ones who were still around are Debbie and myself, really. Like Amanda no longer does TV. Mm -hmm. But um, they really nurtured. It was like being a baby and being spoon-fed. They took you care of you. You took dance class. You did acting class. You, they, in, in, uh, they started a program when I was there to um, show us their own movies, We the Young People. Of all the films you made in the 50s, do you have any particular favorites? In the 50s? Mm -hmm. Prior to West Side Story. Uh, well, I suppose th there is one that you mentioned earlier, which was kind of fun, uh, a Garden of Evil with Gary yeah, Cooper, yeah. which was wonderful, and Susan Hayward. Mm -hmm. I, I, meeting Gary Cooper was unreal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one that was great fun because of the actor who was in it was a film with Tyrone Power called Untamed. Untamed, yes. yes. Again with, with Susan Hayward, I think, is the Yes, she was the lady. leading lady, yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. Since you worked with so many uh, of the top stars of that of that era, mm -hmm. and we read and hear so much about the, the temperament that could be found on sets and so forth, and you worked with, with Lana Turner, with, um, with Susan Hayward several times. Did you see much of the temperament? Uh, only in, with Lana. Really? Once. She, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget it. I did a film with Lana and Ricardo Montalban called Latin Lovers, which I had a very small role. And um, Lana used to be picked up every lunch hour at the soundstage in a big limousine and driven to the commissary, which is where we had lunch, which was literally two minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what, that's what it was like when you were a star. And then she'd get off the limousine, have her lunch, the limousine would then pick her up after lunch and take her back to the uh, stage 15, which was a couple of minutes <laughs> away. I mean, it's like going from here to the exit of this studio. Yeah. And, uh, they didn't pick her up one day, and she had puppies. <laughs> she was shaking with anger. She was so upset. She was just shaking. How dare they? And I often think, what a shock it must be for people like that when they are no longer stars yeah. and no longer treated. Though I have a feeling that Lana's always been treated like a star, no matter where she goes. She is. I saw her a year ago at a uh, benefit and introduced myself to her because I'm sure she, she wasn't going to remember me in that tiny part in that f film. And I was so pleased when she told me she was a fan of mine. She said, you're a fan of mine? <laughs> what, 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 what have you seen? I couldn't believe it. You know, I still remember Ava Gardner's comment about that whole star system, uh, star system treatment at MGM. She looks back on it with, uh, she pretty much calls it uh, garbage. That's not quite the word she used, but I know the word she uh, used. But she says uh, <laughs> she says it was all garbage. But when you had to change trains in Chicago, Metro was marvelous. Ah, <laughs> that's <laughs> marvelous. Were, they were exactly right, there. right. Mm -hmm. They did everything for you. But what happened too is that they made children. The the so many of those stars were so immature to begin with, immature, mm -hmm. that when they were either let go or their careers began to fade, they were helpless. They were very sad. I, I know of several examples of whom obviously I wouldn't mention. But it, it would break your heart because they didn't know how to do anything for themselves. Mm. They really didn't. It was like a child leaving home, a very yeah. spoiled child. Yeah. 
and, and trying to fend for themselves and suddenly realizing that laundry has to get washed and ironed yeah. in order for it to be clean and to be <laughs> worn, you know. A so, rude awakening. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, um, West Side Story is undoubtedly one of the great screen classics, 10 Academy Awards, including one for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, were you entirely pleased with, um, with everything about the film, with the way Anita came across, with what you were trying to do with the character? I was pleased very much with Anita. I was resentful at the time of the fact that we were all required, all the Hispanic uh, uh, actors were required to wear dark makeup because uh, when it was a very dark shade because uh, I kept insisting, which of course is so, that uh, Puerto Ricans are of every shade and a lot of people don't know that and they were just fostering an image that uh, I thought was a wrong or an incorrect one. It certainly wasn't done with any kind of uh, viciousness in, yeah. in mind, but uh, that's how they saw Puerto yeah. Ricans too. But yeah. my goodness, my grandmother was a Spaniard and as fair as you are with, in fact, blue eyes. Mm -hmm. And I have an aunt who is quite brown. You know, she's very, very olive skinned. So it, we were a mix of many things. And I, would, I was very upset about that. Um, I thought at the time that Natalie Wood was a rotten choice for her. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I wanted to see a, a girl who could really sing mm -hmm. do it. But so did they, in fairness to them. They tested everybody in the world. They tested everybody in the world for my role. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a question of finding a combination that could do uh, everything at least well, if not great. I could sing, I could dance, and I certainly could act. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was the one who won the role despite many other people testing for it because I did, probably I was the best combination of the three uh, things th that were needed for Anita. I've always been very curious, how do they divide the duties between Robert Wise and Jerome Robbins? Uh, I don't know. I, that seemed to be an awfully good collaboration. I, I suppose you know that Jerome Robbins was dismi dismissed in the middle of the mm -hmm. film, uh, which was unfortunate. On the other hand, from the standpoint of the producers, Jerome at the time was a man who couldn't bear the thought of um, saying print it because once he said print that take, it was forever. It was for the archives and for posterity. And Jerry Robbins was one of those choreographers who had 20 different versions of the same dance. And in the middle of shooting would suddenly say, I think I prefer version B of section two. Mm -hmm. And we would do things like that. And the producers kept saying, we can't afford this. We can't, you're, you're costing us an awful lot of money. When I think now of what films cost, yeah. you could die laughing sure. or weep because of the loss of a Jerome Robbins. Sure. But, um, I think they had a very good collaboration. Uh, Jerry, I think, was the, um, the inspiration. And Robert Wise was the man who knows everything there is to know about editing mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the looks of things. He used to have a, a huge wall full of uh, magazine clippings in color of looks that he liked. Anita, in, in, in the, um, the quintet, when everyone's singing at the same mm -hmm. time, tonight, tonight. Right. He got the image for my scene when I'm saying, Anita's going to get her kicks tonight. I was sitting on a brass bed and putting on stockings in a black slip. That was taken from a picture in Esquire magazine uh, of Juliet Greco, huh. the folk singer in, um, in France. He saw this picture in Esquire and said, that's the look I want for Anita when she's singing her section of the quintet. Yeah, Wise has always had a wonderful eye for composition. Oh. A marvelous oh. eye. And he's such a terrific man. Do you yeah. know him? Oh, yeah, yeah. And a, a nice man. Dear man, yes. One, a of, good, the, one of the great person. gentleman directors, I think. Truly. Um, now, traveling about, as you're doing now on, um, on The Odd Couple, we were talking earlier about the real difficulties, even though you know, going from city to city can be fun. Mm -hmm. um, Eating out in hotels all the time often is not all that much fun. How do you compensate for that? I How hate it. I, I've traveled enough in my life so that I don't ever want to see the inside of a restaurant <laughs> again. I know it's hard for people to believe that because most people don't have to do that. But eating out three times a week is a horror to me. So I bring a kitchen with me. I have a foot locker with uh, an electric wok, uh, a six-quart pressure cooker in which you can make the most terrific pot roast, my dear. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I can also make soups in that. 
and uh, an electric frying pan, my knives, the works, and I arrange it, and it's in my contract that I am to have, if it's a hotel, it has to be a hotel that has an apartment with a kitchen in it, and mm -hmm. I cook. I cook all the time. And I brought something for you to taste. Wonderful. <laughs> well, you've gotten heavily involved with uh, your own recipes for, for Campbell's Yeah, soup. I've been, I've just joined Campbell's Soup Kitchens, and uh, it's a very happy association because I've used them all my life. Mm -hmm. Most people do. It's one of those staples that every, everybody's cupboard has. And what's special about Campbell's uh, soups is that they, you can make sauces out of the soups. I, I've always wanted to meet the guy or the woman who suddenly one day said, listen, this would make a marvelous dip. <laughs> I can't, you know, it's like, how was popcorn born? How incredible that somebody would think of that. So this that I brought with me today, which is already prepared, is made with, it's a, um, it's a celery dip. And it has, it's made with cream of celery soup. And you don't use any liquid. You put chopped up chutney in it and uh, curry powder and scallions. And is there something I forgot? Is that it? That's it. That's it. You just do that with it's, the soup. It sounds and you delicious. Got, you got to taste it. Come on. Be a sport. I will. I mean, I if will. you were nice enough to ask me about this, you'll love it. All right. It's full of curry. It's terrific. And the best thing is that in one, in one serving of Campbell's soup, this creamy type has 110 calories. You once said that, uh, Aren't you that cooking was your... 110 was your, calories? Cooking was your second stage. Yeah. So you, you must be right on that. <laughs> I am. Well, you know, we are out of time. We're going to show the address where people can write in and get some of your recipes. Yes, the Campbell's recipes. I would and, love that. Um, There's a brochure with my recipes. Good. And they are mine. All yours. That's, well, weren't, I work with the Weren't dreamed up people. by some PR person, huh? <laughs> okay. Hell no. I'm a good cook. Rita, this has been a delight for me, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I have. And much success with, uh, with The Odd Couple. Thank you. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sample some of this. You got to. Okay. I'm going to make you. My You'll thanks. be amazed. See, you won't think it's soup. Before, let me say good night first. My thanks to all of you for watching. Until next time, good night. Bye.